Thanks for the introduction. Uh, like he said today, I'm going to be talking to you about wilderness. Um, this might be something you've never heard of or you just didn't, you don't fully understand. Um, and so my goal today is to hopefully educate you on what wilderness is and get you interested in going out and exploring some of these wild places that exist within West Virginia and other states. Um, so today I'll start by, you know, introducing myself, my background, the organization that I work for, um, what wilderness is and the characteristics of wilderness. Um, I did have a short video that I was going to show, but it doesn't look like it's going to work. Um, so I'll just send that out later. Um, I'll talk to you about how wilderness was created, why you should be, um, why it should be continued to be protected, uh, how it's different from other public lands like the national forests, uh, national parks, who can be using wilderness, the activities that you can do within wilderness, some of the main threats to wilderness, and at the end I'll talk about some of the animals that exist within wilderness and how you can protect these areas. Um, and at the very, very end, I'll go into showing you what wilderness areas exist within uh, West Virginia. So it's a lot to cover, so let's get started. So like I said, my name is Kirsten Belcher. I'm originally from York County, Pennsylvania, but I've lived here in West Virginia for about 10 years. Uh, I completed my bachelor's in 2016 from WVU, and following that, I worked for the West Virginia Division of Natural Resources. Uh, at that job, I was a technician for the deer project leader uh, slash disease biologist. I then went back to school at WVU to get my master's in 2018, where I studied the spatial ecology of bobcats in the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia for three years. And this past May, I finally graduated and I started working for Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards. So with my job at SALS, I am completing education plans for each of the wilderness areas within the Monongahela National Forest. And these will be used to help give people a better understanding of wilderness. Um, other stuff that I do for the organization is work with the West Virginia Highland Conservancy. I've trained some of their volunteers to conduct solitude monitoring within Dolly Sods. I also did some of my own solitude monitoring in Otter Creek Wilderness and Roaring Plains West. I also have done volunteer days in some of the wilderness areas, and I go out with the Forest Service to do trail maintenance. So like I said, I work for Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards, and we work solely within wilderness areas in the Southern Appalachian um, region of the United States. And we have a large partnership with the Forest Service and they fund some different projects that we do so we can help maintain these wilderness areas. Um, some of the stuff that we do as an organization include education. Um, so we attend different community events to raise awareness of wilderness and provide people with information pertaining to wilderness. Um, here I am at, uh, it was Adventure One down in Southern uh, West Virginia this past September. And so we had a stand there just to provide information about the wilderness areas here in West Virginia. We also do community engagement. And so this includes doing volunteer days with local um, community businesses or organizations. And pictured here is a crew of people from Greenbrier Valley Brewing Company. Uh, they came out and did a volunteer day in Cranberry where we did some trail maintenance. Um, we also do volunteer days to do uh, campsite cleanup or pick up litter. Um, a big mission of our organization is to do workforce development. And so this means when our employees start, we train them. And when I started, I got trained in CPR, wilderness first aid, and I became a class A crosscut sawyer. We do wilderness relevancy. And so we build relevancy for wilderness uh, and public lands, engaging the next generation of public land enthusiasts. We create and maintain partnerships with other outdoor or wilderness organizations, and we are always looking to create new partnerships. And most importantly, we do wilderness stewardship. And this means we have uh, trail crews, rangers, or specialists like myself, that go out and do trail maintenance. Um, this includes cutting down trees that are on um, the trails, 
using a crosscut saw like pictured here. Uh, we collect many types of data, like the solitude monitoring data that I mentioned. We do rec site data, um, different things about vegetation, air quality, soil quality, uh, water quality. Um, and while we're out in the wilderness areas, we interact with visitors to provide them with information on wilderness and answer any questions that they may have. So now that you know what my organization does for wilderness, let's get into what exactly wilderness is. Um, when you think of the word wilderness, what are you picturing? Is it some beautiful overlook look like this one here in West Virginia? Maybe you're picturing the newest national park here in the United States, New River Gorge. Or maybe you're just thinking of a forest in general. Maybe you're thinking of some wild landscape out west. Now, if you're thinking of any of those as wilderness, you wouldn't exactly be wrong, um, but true wilderness um, they, is federally designated land. And so these are some of the wildest places in the United States. Um, <clears throat> they were created to stay wild, created to preserve and protect the natural ecosystems and wild areas that, and also provide opportunities for primitive recreation and solitude. And uh, the more, most important thing about the federally designated wilderness areas is that they are public land. This means that they belong to all the citizens of the United States, um, including yourself. In total, there are 803 wilderness areas in the United States, totaling about 111 million acres. And the wilderness areas can be maintained by either the Forest Service, National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, and Bureau of Land Management. Um, I was gonna show a video here, but it doesn't wanna cooperate. So I'll just go into the four main characteristics of wilderness. So untrammeled, and it's kind of a weird word. I'm not saying untrampled, untrammeled. And it means that um, these areas are maintained and you can't do take certain equipment out into wilderness. So this means that you can't take any kind of motorized equipment like a chainsaw and you can't take any kind of a mechanized equipment like a bicycle out into wilderness. So there's now no mountain biking within wilderness. These wilderness areas are natural. Um, they're natural and they're supposed to stay natural. And so there's no alteration to the landscape. So no cutting of live trees or grass that is off the trail. There's no controlled fires to alter the area. And there's no spraying of invasive plant species within wilderness. Everything is to remain as it has been for years and will continue to remain that way. Uh, when you go out into wilderness, there's no developed area. So if you're looking for a bathroom, you're not gonna find any kind of bathroom facility. Um, you're not going to find any um, developed recreation sites like a picnic table out there or um, a certain area to put your tent or even like a camp stove. And your water sources are going to be limited to streams, creeks, and rivers that you filter. There's no water fountains while you're out there. And lastly, these wilderness areas um, give you outstanding opportunities for either primitive recreation or solid. There shouldn't be any kind of noise pollution from cars or um, planes or chainsaws, and there shouldn't be tons of crowds of people out there. You should be able to have solid, complete solitude while you're out in wilderness. So now we'll go into how the wilder these wilderness areas even came to be. So in the 40s and 50s, the United States started to change their thoughts on conservation. Um, there was the creation of the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. Well, in 1964, the Wilderness Act was passed about 57 years ago. And this created the National Wilderness Preservation System. Um, on that day that it was passed, 54 areas of land became designated wilderness areas. And then about 11 years after that, the Eastern Wilderness Act was passed that added an additional 16 wilderness areas in the Eastern portion of the United States. And this included Dolly Sods and Otter Creek Wilderness Area. About eight years later, a 
Public Law 11111 was passed, and that added Cranberry, Laurel Fork North, and Laurel Fork South wilderness. And then finally, in 2009, the Omnibus Public Land Management Act was passed, and this added Roaring Plains West, Big Draft, and Spice Run wilderness, while giving additional acreage to Dolly Sods and Cranberry. So why should we protect these wilderness areas? Well, these areas preserve um, these wild places in its national, natural condition. But, so who can use is there for every single person to use, no matter your background, you know, no matter where you live, anybody can use wilderness, they're there for everyone to use. And there are tons of activities that you can do within wilderness. Um, some of the activities include, you can go out and kayak and canoe in wilderness areas that have access to rivers. Um, you can go down in, on the Greenbrier River and you can kayak or canoe to Spice Run Wilderness. Probably the best way to actually access that wilderness area. You can go for a day hike out there. You can go fly fishing if they provide, you know, streams to do that in. And I know that's a big thing, a big draw to cranberry wilderness. You can go on a multi-day backpacking trip within wilderness. Um, in the winter, you can go cross-country skiing. Um, certain wilderness areas even allow horseback riding. It's a lot more common out west, but most of the ones here in West Virginia, you can do that in. Um, you can still go hunting in wilderness. And if, if the opportunity exists, you can go rock climbing. And so uh, why is, or how is wilderness different than any other public land? So there's a few important things that you should know before you go to wilderness. Like I said earlier, motorized or mechanized equipment such as chainsaws or bicycles are not allowed within wilderness. You can also not, you cannot cut live standing trees for firewood. Um, you can only chop up trees that have already died and fallen to the ground. And you also don't really want to be using live wood to make a fire because it won't make a very good fire. Um, there are also no marking of trails. Um, there are trailhead signs with maps within um, around the borders of the wilderness area before you enter it. Um, <clears throat> and within the wilderness area, there won't be any kind, so there's no kind of blazing on the trees like you see in um, different portions of the national forest or backcountry area. Um, though you will see signs at trail intersections. Um, there are also no man-made structures within wilderness. So there's no shelters or bathrooms. Um, Typically, when a wilderness area is designated, any kind of man-made structure will be removed. And finally, there should not be any groups larger than 10 people when going into wilderness. If you do have a group that is larger than that, consider breaking um, your group up into, into multiple groups and camping at different campsites. And so there are um, six main threats to wildernesses. Um, they're a pretty unique place. And unfortunately, these threats um, can really hurt the areas. Um, so invasive species, unfortunately, can make their way into wilderness and create a lot of issues, um, especially because there is no management done to wilderness areas to um, fix the issue once they are there. Um, <clears throat> An emerging threat is climate change, and this can be seen in the form of wildfires caused by drought. This is um, especially common out west. Um, severe weather can also cause flooding within these areas, and that actually happened down in North Carolina this year. Uh, pollution is a big threat to streams or air quality within wilderness. Overuse is also a threat, and this can actually be seen at Dolly Sod's wilderness. In the last five years, Visitation has increased so much that trails have become these huge mud pits. One of the trails, if you start walking on it, you have to be careful because the mud pit could be up to your hip. Um, and there's also a safety concern with the amount of people that are 
um, going to places like Dolly Sots. Um, at different points in the season, the there's so many cars parked along the forest road that it can cause, um, you know, kind of a traffic jam. And if uh, emergency personnel needs to get through to help people, they might not be able to get, you know, to that person in time. Um, interestingly enough, technology can actually be a threat to wilderness. Um, drones are becoming more common and people want to use them in wilderness, but they are actually illegal because they disturb um, other people's need for solitude. And I put a phone because a phone can actually be kind of um, a threat when more and more people are going to wilderness and they're using just their phone as a way to look at the trail and they don't have a paper copy um, of the, the trail map. This can be a concern if the, the phone dies and then safe uh, search and rescue has to come out and try to find this person. And finally, visitors having a lack of wilderness awareness. And so this means that people are not aware that they are in wilderness and they're not abiding by the rules and regulations of wilderness and um, they're not following leave no trace principles. So now that we talked about what wilderness is, um, who can use it and all the history of it. Let's talk about some of the wildlife that calls wilderness home. And I would like to say when you're out in the wilderness, you should always uh, keep a safe distance from any kind of wildlife. Do not disturb them and never approach them. Um, while there is a chance that you can see some wildlife species such as deer, squirrel, or chipmunks, there are other wildlife species that are a bit more elusive and you might not actually see them, but there are always ways to know that they are present within wilderness, which for me is just as cool. When I'm out hiking, I'm always looking for signs of different am animals. If I find anything like scat or animal tracks, I like to take a picture so that when I go home, I can properly identify it and know what animal was actually present in wilderness. And you can always carry any kind of field guide out there with you, you know, so you can identify it while you're out in the field. So I'll talk about bobcats first because that's something that's near and dear to my heart are bobcats, especially since I spent many years studying them. And so they are one of the most elusive animals that we have here in West Virginia. Some people will go their entire life without seeing a single one. And that's because they have, they can hear, see, or smell you long before you'll ever see them. But you do have a good chance to see the signs that they leave behind. And here are a few paw prints of bobcats I found out, found while I was out hiking in Dolly Sod's wilderness. And they can be identified by the size, the shape, and potentially the lack of claw marks. So you should never base your identification solely off the lack of claw marks. Um, bobcat scat can also be similar to uh, coyotes, but they will be a little bit smaller and not have as much hair present. And that's because bobcats are able to break down more of the hair than coyotes can from their prey. And so I'll, go, I'll talk a little bit more about bobcats. And so since my research was on um, looking at the home range of bobcats in the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia, I did actually have two individuals that use Dolly Sods as part of their home range. And so here's a picture of me putting a GPS collar on one of my uh, study animals. And then the other picture is actually um, a picture that a guy got off his trail camera of one of my cats, I believe in Pendleton County. And then the map I have here is actually two individuals. So one individual is in red and that's all of their locations and then another individual in the blue. And as you can see, they were all over the area, but I guarantee you that no one ever saw them. And each of the locations is about eight hours in between. And so I would get their location data um, about 48, uh, every 48 hours on my computer. So the next animal I will talk about is a black bear. And so this is another animal you may see out in the wild, but you have a better chance of seeing the signs of a black bear. So you likely won't see them or any signs of them during the colder months when they are hibernating. Uh, but in the spring, summer, and fall, you have a high likely uh, chance of seeing them. So 
The two pictures I have here, one is of a uh, fall print that I got while I was out hiking in Laurel Fork South. And then the picture of the scat is actually one I found when I was out hiking in Roaring Plains West. Um, and so their paw prints are pretty distinguishable. They're pretty large, um, but you will notice that the front and back paws have different lengths. Um, it's also important to note that during the spring season, you should be very cautious if you do ever run into a black bear, um, because if it is a female, they could potentially have cubs and they are very protective of them. When I was out hiking my first week on the job in Otter Creek Wilderness, I actually ran into a black bear cub. It just came barreling down the trail towards me. I froze, it saw me and it ran away, but then my concern switched to where is the mother? And so what I ended up doing was very slowly backing my way down the trail without turning around because I didn't wanna put my back towards where the animal had come from. And I walked like that for quite a bit. And then once I felt a safe distance away, I finally turned around and went back down the trail. I just came up. Um, and then bear scat is uh, pretty distinguishable. distinguishable. It's uh, pretty large. It'll be typically in a, like a pile and there should be some kind of seeds present, but it just depends on the season. And then the last animal I will talk about is the coyote. Um, you do have a chance of seeing this animal, but like the other ones, you have a greater chance of seeing the signs that they leave behind. Um, and it can be difficult to identify their tracks just because they are similar to a dog and dogs are allowed to be in wilderness. But uh, coyote tracks will be a bit more compact and have more of an oval shape to them. And the claws are gonna be typically less uh, prominent than if it was a dog. And for the scat, they will typically typically have a bunch of hair present in the scat and be somewhat similar to your dog's uh, scat. And so now that we've talked all about wilderness, how can you help protect wilderness? Uh, with all those threats and everything, well, you can uh, follow leave no trace principles. And you can even get a certificate online if you go onto the Leave No Traces website. They have a free program where you can, you know, learn about it and complete some quizzes and print out a certificate. Um, you can educate others about wilderness so that they become more aware of wilderness. You and your family can do a volunteer day. Um, you can do some minor trail maintenance or uh, litter cleanup in wilderness. You can do it with you know, an organization or you can just go out on your own and pick up litter. Um, be a good steward. Um, if you're out hiking and you notice that someone maybe accidentally dropped some kind of trash like gum wrapper, granola wrapper, just pick it up. And if wilderness is something that really interests you, um, in the future, you can always join an organization that does um, that stewards wilderness areas, like my organization. And so lastly, let's talk about the wilderness areas near you. So like I mentioned, there are eight uh, wilderness areas that are solely within um, West Virginia, but there is one that is partially in West Virginia, but it's managed by Virginia. And so we have Dolly Sods, we have Otter Creek, Roaring Plains West, uh, Laurel Fork North, Laurel Fork South, Cranberry, Spice Run, and Big Draft. Um, so yeah, like I said, there are eight here in West Virginia, but there's also 23 wilderness areas in Virginia. And I encourage you to look up all these different wilderness areas near you and in your state and go out and explore them. And with that, I'll take any questions. 
Thank you so much. Um, I can't see myself. Oh, there I am. Uh, thank you so much for this great presentation. And I took like I took a lot of notes for myself. <laughs> um, I've always wondered about uh, wilderness area objectives and sort of the um, regulations around them. And I'll start with some questions of my own is, um, how are wilderness areas designated initially? Um, so it can be quite the process. Usually um, at some point, if an area that people want to eventually make into a wilderness area, they will set aside and it'll become a wilderness study area. And so they will be labeled that for quite some time until there can be enough push and to get them into a federally designated wilderness area. Um, I know that the most recent ones like Big Draft and Spice Run, um, I think Big Draft was managed as a backcountry recreation area prior to designation. And Spice Run, I think just, you know, existed. I mean, there's no trail system in that area. So it's kind of really unique. Um, but there was a lot of push from local communities and local organizations down in Southern West Virginia that really pushed it to get designated. So it's, it's quite the process. There has to be a lot of support um, and it might sit as something else for quite some time. Does it have to be uh, within existing federally managed land? Um, I don't think it has to be 100% of the time, but it typically is close to a national forest or national park or BLM land. Gotcha. Um, we've got a good question, which is uh, how can I get a hold of a trail map of a West Virginia wilderness area so I can hike safely? So all of the wilderness areas have maps online. If you go onto the Forest Service uh, website, um, I believe there's, there'll be a bunch of tabs or things that you can press on the left-hand side. And it should be like under recreation and maybe hiking. And then it should have a list of the wilderness areas. And there is a downloadable PDF uh, brochure on each of the wilderness areas for um, the Monongahela National Forest. That's great. I, um, I found it particularly interesting where you were talking about Dolly Sods, which I have had the pleasure of visiting before, uh, not as much as I'd like to, but uh, I, I know it's popular. And um, I, it gets me thinking about some of our own work about trying to engage youth in experiencing the outdoors in a different way than they might. We're so blessed with so much outdoor, uh, such a rich outdoor environment here in West Virginia, but getting into a more wild space. And um, I, I guess, uh, what have you found to be particularly effective when you're working with a group like a community group on a volunteer um, activity or, I don't know, some other public group so that they can understand the value of wilderness? It's a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I don't think there's one like thing that really works. Um, I think it's just one of our big things that gets people kind of interested in wilderness uh, when we do like the community events is we typically take out a paint stand and a piece of, you know, a tree or something. And we take our cross, cross cut saws out and mm -hmm. we people use those to cut a cookie. And they're like, wow, this is super cool. And it's like, yeah, this is what we do in wilderness. And that seems to really interest people because they're like, oh, I want to do that. I want to use a cross cut saw. And like, why are you guys using these in these areas? Why aren't you using a chainsaw? And then, you know, explaining that. So we kind of start, you know, letting people know what wilderness is. That's really interesting. I thought of that too with a cross cut saw because we have an old one that's set in the shed and of course I don't use it. So I know that's true for other people too. Um, I also, would, we just got another question, I'm sorry. What's the most rare plant or animal you have encountered in a wilderness area? Ooh, I don't know if I've actually encountered anything like super rare while I was out there. Ugh. I mean, a lot of the plants in Dali Sods are pretty unique and rare. Um, a lot of the different like mosses and lichen and stuff. Um, a couple, I guess a couple of the different plants maybe down at Cranberry are pretty rare. 
Um, I don't know if I found anything super rare, animal or, or plant wise. <laughs> All pretty common. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a sort of a related question that you can answer however you like. It's something that we spend time thinking about, and I think in general folks are thinking about more is what you mentioned, climate change affecting the uh, wilderness areas mm -hmm. and um, wilderness areas perhaps being more of a refuge for uh, species that are rare or having to migrate to a different location so that they can survive a changing climate. And um, I just wonder if you could share anything that you have observed about that process going on right now. Um, like how wilderness is helping with those? Like you know, counteract that? Or just if you've noticed um, uh, any specific examples of how climate change is affecting the wilderness areas or uh, what lives in the wilderness areas, how you have to manage them? Thankfully, the, the ones here in West Virginia, I don't think have seen any kind of change due to climate change um, yet. Um, I think that they're far, far enough away from some of the, the things that would like pollution or something that would hurt them. Um, yeah, I haven't really observed anything, you know, with that occurring, I don't think. Okay. Yeah. I wish I had a better answer to that. <laughs> That's all right. I had uh, another question, which is, um, I wondered um, if you all had a recommendations for people who live near a wilderness area, and it doesn't have to be right next to a wilderness area, but uh, here in West Virginia, there is some statistic I always forget, which is the highest percentage of small landowners um, in the country as a percentage of the population. A lot of folks live on a little piece of land and they love it. Um, it what are some things that we can do as folks who live on our plot of land in West Virginia that will help wilderness stay wild. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I'm, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is um, a lot of the cabins that are near Dolly Soft, like along Red Creek and stuff, um, you know, just not do, altering anything to the stream. You know, don't be polluting and like adding stuff in and don't release any kind of, you know, fish that shouldn't be there in those streams. Um, you know, just be careful with, um, having like a bonfire or anything like that, because, you know, those will be detrimental to these wilderness areas. Um, yeah, I think just using like common sense and don't just, don't be polluting and just, you know, uh, don't be altering anything that could flow downstream and hurt these wilderness areas. <laughs> um, Really appreciate one thing that I, I usually ask folks is how did you get to do what you do and you do so many different things in your job which is awesome um, I think would be the envy of other people and you already shared about that and I guess what is what's something you look forward to doing either in your role now or in the future related to wilderness or the resources in a wilderness um, what's exciting to you about the future in this kind of work um, just, uh, I don't know. I just like to be out there doing, continue to be able to do the hikes and stuff like that. And I, I think one of my favorite things while I'm out there is seeing more and more people enjoy these wilderness areas. So like getting the word out there more about wilderness and interacting with more people in the future. Um, currently I don't really see many people when I'm out there hiking. So like, I hope that in the future, there's more people enjoying different activities out there and I can interact with them. That's great. I look forward to it too. And um, I actually, there are a few of the wilderness areas on your map, even though I think I kind of know where some of them are. Um, I definitely need to uh, seek out myself. You said, I just had one other uh, small question related to that. You mentioned that dogs can, a personal dog, be with you in a wilderness area or um, what did you mean by that the dogs can be in a wilderness area? Yeah, so dogs are allowed within wilderness. I know that like if you go to a national park, dogs aren't uh, usually allowed there, um, but you can take dogs to wilderness areas and there's no rule that officially says that you have to keep your dog on leash, 
but you just need to be able to control your dog while out there. So like mm -hmm. if you have a well-trained dog that you can do voice commands with that'll listen, you can have your dog off leash, but you know, it just has to be controlled. I bet that would make it more a more comfortable introduction to wilderness if uh, some folks could bring their dogs. That's interesting.